what makes PAs uh, great? Laterality. I've been hearing these things from like people that want to be PAs. You know, why do you want to be a PA? Why do you want to be a PA? There's no way we can give you all the information you need. There is no way in one year. You're just supposed to know what third year medical students know. And then they keep going to school. So you are expected to absorb as much as you can and then go out there and a lot of it is OJT. Figure it out. Just don't kill someone and try to make a fool of yourself. Right? So one of those things is going to be working up abdominal pain in the ER. Right? Because there's no way that first time you see somebody with abdominal pain and they cannot localize it to a quadrant, what would you do? You can't order a CT scan on everyone, right? <laughs> what you say? I was going to say CT and then you said I can't do that. You and can't. You said all the time. <laughs> it's cheaper. It's less, you know, contrast. It's better for the patient. It's cheaper, quicker. But what in the world are you going to do? You know, you make a good history. A good, thank you. And a physical thing. If you can do a good history and listen to your patients, and then, as you'll see the first time you're in the emergency room, actually put your hands on the patient, uh, you'll, be, you'll be further ahead than most first and second year medical students. Okay. The four biggies that you're going to see in the ER with abdominal pain. And I'm not going to talk a lot about how to treat the hemodynamically unstable patient or I'll get I'll the other people that are better at that to lecture to you about that. I'm going to help you think your way through how do I take care of this patient that's before like with their symptoms. Okay? So they're, what are they going to come in with with GI problems in the ER? These are the same patients I saw in clinic that said, I said, you need to go to the ER. I can't do anything for you in my clinic today. <clears throat> they cannot stop their vomiting. They are bleeding to the point that they're becoming hemodynamically unstable. Or they have pain that's uh, severe. Severe enough to warrant the emergency room. Well, we'll talk about that later. Or they've had this abrupt change in their bowel habits. Okay. So abdominal emergencies that are associated with the complaint of pain, we like to call lump into the acute abdomen. Appendicitis, everybody. Everybody knows appendicitis. Bowel obstruction, acute mesenteric ischemia, acute diverticulitis that could come with perforation of the bowel, acute cholecystitis, acute pancreatitis, any perforation anywhere, and then don't forget the AAA, mm -hmm. the ruptured AAA, okay? Bleeding emergencies are bleeding from anywhere along the GI tract. It could be an ulcer, it could be esophageal varices, it could be infectious colitis, which we've talked about, mm -hmm. dysentery, uh, it could be a, a briskly bleeding tumor or cancer somewhere that's eroded into a vessel. But if you're going to treat GI problems in the ER, those are pretty much the main two things you're going to be looking at. Is this person going to bleed to death? And then what do I need about to do about the pain? That's where you have to, as a clinician, figure out, okay, is this, per, is this patient in legitimate pain? Do I need to treat their pain and send them on their way, or do I need to find out what the cause of their pain is, right? Because true abdominal emergencies, the pain is a sign of something. So your job as a clinician that's taking history and laying eyes on the patient and laying hands on the patient, is it, is it real? Is the pain real? Or is this patient being dramatic? Which happens anyway. Okay. So history, of course, we talked about is the most important thing. How quickly did it come on? Where is it? Things like that. Localize it to a quadrant if you can. Okay. Remember the difference between visceral pain and parietal pain, 
right? Visceral pain is kind of diffuse and non-localized. If it starts to localize, you need to be a little bit more concerned, okay? And then don't forget that not all GI pain is, or abdominal pain is of GI origin. Heart attack gives people epigastric pain. Um, uh, gynecologic pain, uh, kidney stones, things like that. It is one of, abdominal pain in and of itself is one of the most common causes to put somebody in the hospital. So a lot of these patients you will admit, it's your job to filter through and see if they need to be admitted. Um, again, like, I can't say how many times location is important, but don't count on it 100%. Always ask if, was your building your differential age is important, how much alcohol they drink, and their gender. Three pretty easy things to get, and they can tell you quite a bit. All right, it's your same things you've been hearing all along for histories, right? Location, character, whether it's severe, sharp, whether it's diffuse, generalized, what makes it worse, what makes it better. The typical patient with an abdominal complaint is going to come in and be curled up in the fetal position, not wanting to move. Especially if they have peritoneal pain, if they've perforated an ulcer, um, they have diverticulitis, appendicitis, they're going to want to be still. Okay, they're going to want to be curled up, still, don't even bump the bed. Remember we talked about just kind of jerking the bed to see if they have peritoneal pain. Um, on the other hand, your patient with renal colic, has anybody seen a patient in renal colic before? Mm -hmm. They are agitated, they are sometimes pacing, they are maybe rocking, they are, they are, they are not sitting still. So you can almost tell that in, in triage if somebody's having renal colic. Okay. How long has the pain been there? Somebody comes in and says, I have a 10 out of 10 pain. This 10 out of 10 pain has been here for three months. No. Okay. 10 out of 10 pain that's been there for two hours and you came straight to the emergency room, probably a higher likelihood of something being really wrong. Not that there isn't something wrong with the patient that's had it for three months, but it's probably not a 10. Okay. My, my ER sister nurse likes to say, okay, a 10 is if you were lit on fire right now before me. That's a 10. You're burning, burning a lot. And some people are having that much pain. The other thing is the vital signs will show if someone is in pain. Okay? Your blood pressure is perfect, heart rate's, you know, 72, and you're on your smartphone. Your pain's probably not a 10. Why not a nine? Why not five? So just paying attention to those cues in the room. Vital signs are really important. Have to ask sexual in, in uh, menstrual history with females, of course. What's the first question you ask them? A female of childbearing age in the emergency room has abdominal pain. Did you be pregnant? When was your last period? And then you still get a pregnancy test, even if they quit bleeding yesterday. Okay? And then again, alcohol consumption. Okay. Get a quick check on whether they have cardiopulmonary problems already leading up to this. So they have hypertension, they have atherosclerosis, they have COPD. Those things are going to clue you in on non-abdominal non causes. Sometimes it's keep it. And I am only putting this up here just purely to illustrate how many things it could be if somebody comes in with abdominal pain. Right? This is the first test of being, you know, a first year PA student, you're going, but I know how to work it up, right? Your preceptor says, what do you think it is? And you go, well, I don't know, but I have three or four differentials that I think it could be, and I know how to work it <coughs> You will make everyone you rotate with happy, okay? So bolded items are the, gonna be the most common, okay? Most common things coming from the GI tract, appendicitis, obstructions, both perforated ulcers, diverticulitis. Okay. The other things you need to think about and have them there, but if somebody comes up with abdominal pain and you don't have a clue, you tell your preceptor what, I think it could be appendicitis, bowel obstruction, or maybe a gallbladder disease. And you 
So, um, acute gallbladder attacks. Um, what's the difference between acute cholecystitis and a biliary colic? Say again. The triad is going to be cholangitis. Like if there's fever, it's, it's going to be acute cholangitis. But you're not going to be able to know if it's acute cholecystitis or biliary colic until you get an alkphos, you know a bilirubin, and then you get an ultrasound and you see whether there's a stone there or not. Okay. But in America, most people come to the ER with acute cholecystitis with no stones. Okay. So you have to look and see, what do you want to know on that ultrasound? You want to know if there's fluid around the gallbladder, thickening of the gallbladder wall, is there anything that looks necrotic, anything that looks sick or abscessed. That's a surgical emergency. Okay. Biliary colic, they might pass the stone and be fine, just like with a kidney stone. Okay. The problem is with biliary colic is when the stone gets stuck in the common bile duct and then you end up with pancreatitis, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the big difference between those two. And you don't, you don't know sitting there in the room with them, unless they say, I've passed gallstones before, I know I have gallstones, okay? But, okay, you know it's biliary colic, but you still need that ultrasound gene to see if the gallbladder's sick, okay? <laughs> sick gallbladders have to come out quickly. Healthy looking gallbladders that are just pushing a stone out, you know, that can pass and be okay. You have to look at your patient, look at their labs, okay? See where the stone is. Acute pancreatitis is a no-brainer, but a lot of people go home now with acute pancreatitis. Just go evaluate in the ER, get their pain under control, send them home. So you need to know how to determine who's going to stay and who's going to go, okay? And that just takes some being out there and learning it. And Ransom's criteria. Don't forget that vascular things happen in the gut too. People come in with heart attacks, but they come in with gut attacks. Okay, they come in with acute mesenteric ischemia, acute colitis that's due to thrombus or or ischemia of some unknown origin. Okay, and don't forget your kidneys. And don't forget your your woman parts. Okay. Number one gynecological cause of abdominal pain: EID. I'll, you all know what that stands for, right? But you really know what it stands for, right? Pus in there? <laughs> See, because you were really here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Pus in there. Okay. I'm not going to kill you with what you need to do for physical exam. Assess their heart and lungs. The question now is these bedside ultrasounds. Okay, which my sister's going to come lecture you guys on the FAST exam later. I mean, it's sometimes, the FAST exam is sometimes they do with their primary survey before they even get a stethoscope out. It's getting to be that ingrained in the emergency room. And so, depending on how stable the patient is, you may put an ultrasound on their belly before you even touch it. Okay, so just know that. You all, you all feel comfortable with determining whether a patient is stable or not? Did you all learn primary survey yet? No. Okay. First thing you're going to ask yourself in the ER when you have somebody with abdominal pain is, do you need a surgeon? Do you emergently need a surgeon? Okay, what signs on physical exam? would make you feel like you need to get the surgeon on the horn fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Profuse bleeding in a hemodynamically unstable patient, for sure. Okay, the pressure is 80 over 40, they're bleeding, you're probably going to need somebody quick. Okay, what else? Perforation and rupture. A sign of a perforation, free, like abdominal rigidity, guarding, distension, Signs on the school fan that they have a perforation, which you're going to confirm with x-ray, okay? Get the, get the uh, surgeon on the horn quickly. What else? 
we have signs of ischemia, like legs are don't have pulses. Okay. Uh, what about really high fever? Maybe my new surgeon might not. Might just need a hospital list. Depends on what it is, but we're going to need to admit them. Um, anybody think of anything else? You would immediately need a surgery for it. Like before you've even hardly done anything. Triple mm -hmm. A. Definitely signs of a triple A. If, yep, if you, they just left the hospital with abdominal surgery and are back in, maybe obstructed or perforated, right? Good job. That's it. Okay. So, how do you work up pain? Here's your bread and butter CBC, CMP, live case. You probably will still see MLAs <coughs> on your board exams, but live case is really more specific to the pancreas. Your analysis, pregnancy test if it's a child bearing age female, cardiac enzymes if you at all suspect it could be a heart attack, EKG, flatten up right abdominal x rays if they're able to cooperate to do that, uh, possibly CT, possibly both. For bleeding, the, not that vitals aren't important on pain, but for bleeding, they're really more important to help you establish their stability. Then you probably want to add in some bleeding studies, PT, INR, maybe a PTT. Um, stick your finger in the rear end, <coughs> see if they've got black positive stool. And if you're thinking bleeding, that may be a time when you don't really need a surgeon, you may need to call the <coughs> GI person on call, because they need to put an EGD in and look immediately for bleeding. Important question, can Bright red bleeding from the rectum be from the upper GI tract. No, no, no. It can. Okay. Classically, melanotic stool, black tarry stool, is upper, is of upper GI origin, and hematochesia, bright red bleeding stool, is from the lower GI tract. But you have to take into account transit time. Okay? So if they are bleeding a, a, a lot, their, up, their blood from the rectum could be from a gastric ulcer if it's flowing through rapidly. Okay? The flip side of that is melana, if this, if this is a constipated person, they only poop once every two weeks, melana could be bleeding from the right side of the colon. So, I want you to know that those things on board exams, those things are going to be always probably black and white. But in the real world, frank, bloody stool, if it's bleeding quite briskly, could be from the upper GI tract. Okay. And if it's a cirrhotic patient with a belly full of ascites and jaundice, it probably their esophageal varices, bleeding, not a colon. You need to have an idea of what x-rays to order, right? This came, this slide came right off of the GI radiology lecture from the mod, GI module. So just kind of know your general vicinity where things are, okay? All that space in the middle is usually small bowel. And you need to know how to evaluate for, for free air. You need an upright. And you need them in the lateral decubitus position, usually with the left side down, right side up. Okay. If you suspect it, you may not have to get it on everybody's abdominal exam. It, it, you have to kind of get a feel for where you are in the ER. If their protocol is everybody gets a three view KUV, then do what do what they do. But um, if you suspect there's free air, you really need that lateral. So again, you don't have to make a decision immediately. You can say, okay, this I'm not sure about this patient. I'm going to keep them here in the ER for three or four hours and six hours, whatever, and just kind of watch them and see if they progress. You can even do that with bleeding people. You'll see if they drop their hemoglobin over two or three hours. Okay. 
So repeat exams, IV fluids, antiemetics, maybe an NG tube, maybe not. Surgical consult if you need it. And then your antibiotics. You probably, unless you are absolutely sure they need them, again, the ERs will have protocols for you to follow, but they have a high fever, you're probably going to be giving them antibiotics quickly, especially if you think they perforated. But if you don't think they perforated, you might call the surgeon first and see if they want the, probably the surgeon will want the antibiotics on board. So. Don't, I'm not going to read this to you. This is just a, you know how much I love these, right? <laughs> Just working through the work that I'll do when I do some of these bleeding. Okay. Um, and a lot of this goes with your shock lecture too. So you guys will learn how to treat shock later. I don't know who comes and does that for you. It might be Brad. Okay, so again, so you've kind of done the basic workup, you're deciding if they need, do you need a surgeon or do you need a gastroenterologist? You would need a surgeon for surgery, but you might need a gastroenterologist for bleeds. Okay, especially uppers, they can actually, you know, treat the bleed. They could inject epinephrine right in it or cauterize it, depending on what it is. So, band it. So, if you decide you don't need a gastroenterologist or a surgeon, give them back their volume. Slidey fluids, treat their pain, put them on bowel rest, send them home on some antibiotics, decide if they need antibiotics or not. Okay. So for instance, diverticulitis. You make sure it's not perforated, got their pain under control, you've counseled them that they're not going to die. Put them on antibiotics and send them home, right? So how do you, what's the disposition for a patient with abdominal pain with an ER? Well, here's your choices. You can either observe them for a while, admit them, get your surgical consult, or discharge them. Those are your choices. That's easy, right? Okay. That's all you need to know about abdominal pain. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. So, pain, treatment of pain, is going through this whole new changing idea, right? We don't have to snow people with opioids. Give them IV Tylenol. Give them something, you know, that's not going to give them a high. And watch them. So pain medicine in the ER is changing, okay? Um, we need to get people over this idea that I can just, I'm just having a bad day, so I just go to the ER and get some Dilaudid so I feel a lot better, you know? So using your clinical skills to decide if they are really sick or not, and then treating their pain conservatively, yes. Because you want to, especially if you're going to watch them, you need to see those signs if they change. So you don't want to snow them down with, with Dilaudid and let them sit there and sleep and then they rupture their ulcer and you don't know it because they're in La La Land. Okay. So that does bring up a good point about abdominal pain. I, 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 being NGI, I've never given anyone narcotics for abdominal pain, ever. Of course, I can't prescribe them anymore right now. But even in the beginning of my career, I've never given narcotic pain medication for abdominal pain. If it's something acute that they need surgery for, then have the surgery. If it's something they can take antibiotics for and go home, they can get away with Tylenol, even in a cirrhotic patient. So, um, Yes, so conservative treatment of their pain. Analgesics could be Tylenol. It doesn't have to be morphine. Okay. Also, ER physicians are are not prescribing them to go. <laughs> Don't get your order to go anymore. 
come in and you get your pain assessed and you get your pain treated and if I feel like you need an opioid, you can have it when you're here, but if I send you home with a prescription for opioids, it's going to be like for a day. You know, it's no more of this sending them home with 30 or 60 Percocet. Okay. Are any other questions before we do some cases? You all know, right? No, work it up. Okay. So this lady's old, 90 years, 90 years old. She has a history of gallstones, sister arthritis. She's presenting with just generalized severe abdominal pain. But it started about seven hours prior. Never had anything like it before. She hasn't thrown up. She's not running a fever. Her bowels are okay. She just feels bloated. She did pass a small bowel movement earlier today. Okay, everybody got a picture in their mind? She's little, she's 90, a little nine-year-old lady. It's Dr. Britton's mom. <laughs> Bad arthritis. Okay. Here's what you check. So you've checked, make sure she's not having a heart attack, which you should with any little lady having abdominal pain that's not localized. <coughs> did EKG, which is good, that's normal. Her white count's up a little. Her UA's okay. She's not having pancreatitis. Because we've rolled that out with the life case. Okay. Really, her CMP doesn't tell you a whole lot. I wouldn't worry about that sugar. It's probably just a response to her illness. Sodium's a little low, right? She's not, she has no elevation in her liver enzymes. Crop floss is normal, billy root is normal. What do you see on the x ray? Looks kind of like an air bubble, yep. So this is a double, double wall sign, okay? You, if you, on a normal x ray, you should see just like one side of the wall. Okay, you can see the outline of both sides of it. There's free air somewhere. Okay. So, and again, I'll send this PowerPoint out to you guys so you can. Like you point to the double wall. So you can see air on this side, and you can see air on this side, and that goes all the way up. So she's perforated. Okay, so some signs of free air. Here's your double wall sign. You can see the falciform ligament. There's air in the belly somewhere. Okay. And then, of course, if you're seeing this shadow of gas where the liver should be, that one's a little more obscure. I don't notice that one as much, but. She's got kind of a you know, grayish, blackish area over where the liver, there should be solid work in there. So if you're seeing air over it, that's a perforation. Okay? So there's a mud, right? Now, what would you do then? You can see, you get this, you could do a lateral decubitus, see if there's where you layer down her left side, the air should come up over her liver. Or you can get a CT. Okay. There's more double wall signs. Okay. So you're seeing both sides of the wall. And it looks kind of blown up and dilated. Okay. Don't mistake the gastric bubble for free air either though. Know where the gastric bubble is supposed to be. Up under that left hemi diaphragm, you'll see just air in the stomach. Well, I think I have a picture of that later. Okay, any questions about perforation on x-ray? Yes? I don't remember. How do you tell the difference between a small bowel and a large bowel? Most of it, see, the, and that's so dilated, you might confuse it with the small bowel, but your colon, as we'll look later, 
the colon's really deep and it's going to be really far around the edge. Okay? So if you see air in the colon, you'll see it more in this area. Okay? So pretty low. Because the colon is sits way far back. And where the guts are all, small, small intestine guts are all caught up in the front. Okay. Now we have a 71 year old male. And he actually can localize the pain for you. Okay? It's been there a couple of days. It's kind of radiating in his right, right flank a little bit. He's vomiting and doesn't want to eat. And because you were such a good history taker, you immediately asked him if there's been any blood in the vomit, right? And there hasn't. Been watery brown, no blood. No bowel movement today, but he hadn't eaten much. Okay? Bowel movement yesterday didn't have any blood in it. No melanotic, tarry, black stool. Because you're asking him these things, right? Mm -hmm. So he has, a, he has a family history of diabetes. He is a diabetic. He has a family history of gallstones, heart disease. He doesn't use alcohol. He doesn't smoke. Okay? Anything y'all are thinking yet? Anybody want to make a bold prediction? Because of the radiation to the flank, you're thinking kidney. I would put that on the differential for sure. You'd want to get a UA. I would ask him how he had the differential. Absolutely. Ryan wants to say something. I don't remember, but the pancreatitis associated with the diabetes. You want to keep pancreatitis on there? Yep. Okay. All right, he's overweight, he's a little bit distressed, but he's alert. Blood pressure's up a little because he's hurting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he's just a tiny bit of temperature. A little dry, not eating well, he hasn't eaten much today. Lungs are clear, heart rate's rapid but regular. He could be having a heart attack too, you know. You do. With upper abdominal pain in a man, mm -hmm. I would still leave it on there. I would evaluate that. But when you put your hands on him, he's tender in his right quadrant. Mm -hmm. Stool's negative for blood. He doesn't have work, he doesn't know hepatomegaly. He's not jaundice. Okay. Here is your results. PA student. White count's quite high. Hemoglobin's okay. Platelets are normal. <clears throat> what are we looking at here? Look at his, uh, his glucose is crazy out of control. <laughs> but he is a diabetic and he's stressed, right? ALT's 100, AST 65. Those are both up. His alpha is normal. Total bilirubin is so up a bit. Doesn't have pancreatitis. Doesn't have not having a heart attack, and he did have a UA and it was negative. He has no CDH in his. Cirrhosis. you checked it. Cirrhosis. What? Cirrhosis. Men get them too. Everybody wants to, to label it the fat, female, flatulent, 40, fertile. But it's men. And men a lot of times present in the ER. Go figure. We call that our tax. Okay. So. Your ER physician preceptor says, hey, go scan them, go scan them and see what you see. And you're like, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. My sister's going to show you all some tricks when she comes to the block with help. But, huh? Well, I think I have to do that. But, I mean, you just go look for stuff. And that will only work, too, if they're fasting. I mean, if they haven't eaten for a while, it's the only way they're going to see the gallbladder, really. But this is just so you can see what it looks like. All right, so what do you do with him? His white count's high. 
He's in quite a bit of pain. He's a little bit fever, you know, he's got a little bit of fever. We probably, probably put him in and let him have his gallbladder up quickly. Yes? Was the Alphos raised? The Alphos was normal. Why was the Alphos normal? Because it's not in the death. Right. So is it just the ALT and the AST were up possibly? The bilirubin is just, <coughs> just a tiny bit. the only thing that we can and you know the lipase is negative, mm -hmm. and the G wave is negative. So. All right. What would it be called if the stone was in the duct? Anybody remember? Molydocolithiasis. Okay. So acute cholecystitis with cholelithiasis is what he has. Okay. Somebody can have cholelithiasis and not have a sick gallbladder, right? But he's sick. Cholelithiasis is if the stone or stones are trapped in the common bile duct and are obstructing. And then cholangitis is the triad if you add the fever and the jaundice with the right of the water. Okay? Everybody remember, remember all this from what was it in May? Okay, so if there was a stone in the duct, what might you do differently? You might still call the surgeon to have the surgeon on board, but you're going to also get a GI consult because they might be able to get the stones out with the ERCP. Okay. Number three. 64-year-old, abdominal pain and distension, constipated for eight days, just can't take it anymore. Fever, or no fever, no vomiting, no dysuria, no diarrhea, no diarrhea around an impaction. Pretty healthy guy, 64. No idea, that could be anything, right? So you start ordering some stuff. So you're going to think, what do I order? CMP, 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 this abdomen is large, rotund, and tympanic. Mm -hmm. Diffuse tenderness everywhere in the abdomen, but the left lower quadrant, left lower quadrant is slightly more tender. You feel something abnormal in the left lower quadrant. Mm -hmm. Might be a mass, but you don't know because you're a PA student. You've never felt a mass before. Mm -hmm. Your major exam is okay. Did it change anything really? Localized it a little bit, and he might be what? What are the two things you're worried about? Somebody comes in with a blown up belly. Air, you know, perforation, air, or ascites. And then you could do your. <laughs> but you can, you know, do your percussion and, you know, percuss and see if it sounds tympanic. So somebody asked, how do you see the colon? Well, there you go. Okay. So that's how the colon will look outlined if it's obstructed. A lot of air in there. And then it just cuts off right here, right? So you see an air fluid level in the left lower quadrant. Okay, so where is the rectum? Way down here. Okay. So he's obstructed somewhere above the sigma colon. Somewhere in the Left, lower left lower quadrant. Okay. CBC normal, so he's not infected. So if you were thinking maybe it was diverticulitis, <coughs> maybe it's not. Normal kidney function, normal electrolytes. This guy, this case, ends up just being, um, he's impacted the stool. So, it, but it could be a, a colon cancer, you know. Yes. 
So, but if it's way up there, um, I just go like those and doing nothing. Yeah. Uh, you look it will feel. I mean, you might if you was really packed in there, you might be able to feel part of the stool at the end of your finger. Is that a typical appearance of a step ladder sign? Um, this is about obstruction. Yes. Okay. Yes. So yeah, you can start to see those off okay. And then the um, so again, you're in the ER. You don't know what the obstruction is. You think it probably isn't infection because this white counts normal and he's not febrile, right? So could it be a mass? Could it be stool? Could he just have a stricture because he had a colon surgery a few years ago and a stricture down? All those things could be, okay? So you don't need to worry about that in the ER. You just call the surgeon and the gastroenterologist. So based on that image, would you just refer and to And the him? surgeon, yeah, the surgeon may just put him in and watch him, okay? So all you need to do in the ER is find it and then get him to the right person. What I wanted you to know about that one too is large, large bowel obstructions or colon obstructions are a lot less common than small bowel. I mean, you're going to see more small bowel, by far, more small bowel obstructions. Why is that? Anybody have a guess, Taylor? Like diameter of the, the bowel. It, that makes sense, but there may be Water some truth to that. But it's usually because obstructions are caused by scarring. Mm -hmm. And adhesions are more likely to obstruct the small bowel than to obstruct the colon because of the size mm -hmm. and the depth. Colon sits back. Okay. 64 year old. Now, same age group, okay? <laughs> Don't look pain. I'm telling you, if you can make it out of your 60s and your 70s, you might live to be 90. <laughs> but I'm going to kill you. That's usually the decade that happens. <clears throat> All right, abdominal pain, he is having nausea and vomiting. He is having diarrhea. And this has been going on for three days. He's sweating. Okay, interesting thing on this guy is he comes in and like, these symptoms are just like I had last time I tried to wean myself off my oxycodone. Okay. He discontinued it four days ago, cold turkey, and for three days he's had abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. He denies any fever, headache, cough, dysuria, penile discharge, skin changes, or rashes. What other review systems might be helpful for him? I mean, if he's weaning off, if it's due to his oxycodone, I mean, does he have pain anywhere else? Does he have a, is he lightheaded? Is he having syncopal episodes? I mean, that's kind of, weaning off narcotics can give you just about any bad symptom. But it should be getting better, too, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. After, you know, four days of it, four days of weaning. Should be seeing some improvement. Okay, past medical history. He does have rheumatoid arthritis, that's why he's been on the oxycodone. Mm -hmm. He has a remote history of cholecystectomy and appendectomy and exploratory surgery for a gunshot wound. Mm -hmm. He doesn't use alcohol, he does smoke two packs of cigarettes per day. He hadn't traveled anywhere recently. So just don't even look at the HPI. What about the past medical history and the social history? He's had three abdominal surgeries and he's been shot in the gut. Okay, so that would concern me already for an obstruction, right? Just based on this past medical history. Okay. The fact that he smokes two packs of cigarettes per day might worry me about what? What? Water cancer. Yes. <laughs> what about his abdomen? Ischemia? Ischemia. Mesenteric ischemia, atherosclerosis, thrombosis. Yes. Yes, he could. <laughs> <laughs> the one Dr. pro I leave on. <laughs> <laughs> causes blood cancer. <laughs> so you just simply get a KUV and what do you see? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 
So this is mom. Uh, this, she's got periumbilical pain, so she's kind of around the center. It's very severe, 8 out of 10. So when she noted it coming on, she also noticed left leg pain with intensity and frequency, which is weird, right? She's also in left leg extremity claudication for a few weeks. Ding, 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 ding. Well, she all had her answer right now. She reports a recent ankle brachial index test on her left that was abnormal. Ding, 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 ding. Everybody have their answer? Okay. She's having nausea. She's having paresthesias and sensory changes in the left lower leg. She's not having any diarrhea. Really any other symptoms. Okay? She has history of colon cancer. That throws a little bit of a wrench in it, doesn't it? Claudication, multiple abdominal surgeries. So she could be obstructed somewhere. She's had a colon resection from colon cancer. She smokes cigarettes, drinks sometimes. Okay? So this still, what is on your differential just based on your good history you took? Definitely ischemia. She could be obstructed. She could have cancer back somewhere. That bladder cancer. <laughs> hey, don't forget abscess too. You know, you know, you can erode a cancer out of your bladder and have a have a pelvic abscess. Okay. So she is diaphoretic, visibly in pain. She's distressed. Her blood pressure is 146 over 77. It's usually not 146. Heart rate's a little bit rapid. Her abdomen is not soft and non-distended, it's distended. She's severely tender. It's rigid. She's guarding. She's rebound. Her oxygen saturation is a little low. A little low. She does she has smoking cigarettes. Here, though, is you actually palpated her pedal pulses. Look at that. Okay. So, straight to the CCTA. But so, if you're suspecting ischemia, with, with her, you could do regular x-rays first just to see if there's any obstruction. But she didn't have pulses in her lower extremity. She's probably got some big fat clot sitting somewhere, right? So you're going to CTA her, and you can see the mesenteric an artery. I'm assuming that's the superior nerve It's like nothing there. And then this is her iliac. <coughs> you can see where it's obstructed. Her white count's high. She's pretty sick. 99% stenosis of the left iliac. She's got, a, she's got um, stenosis all over her abdomen. These patients can die quickly. And that gut dies, that is a mess to fix. Okay? And with the amount of atherosclerosis and hypertension, smokers that we have, we have to keep in mind mesoteric ischemia. Okay? She actually does have a small little hernia, but it's not obstructed or incarcerated, so we're not worried about that. Okay? So, so your next thing is you find out, before she loses her leg, find out, do you have a vascular surgeon, or are you in Blackwell, Oklahoma? You don't have a vascular surgeon, then you send them somewhere that has a vascular surgeon. Okay. General surgeons usually cannot fix this. Okay, number six. So we have seven. We're back to 73 now. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah, can a abdominal aneurysm cause and keep these pulses? Yes. But what would be different about it? 
and the pulselessness would be bilateral. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the rupture, that abdominal aneurysm is big enough and it's ruptured, they're going to lose pulses in both legs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. Okay. All right. So this guy's 73. You don't feel good. Abdominal, diffuse abdominal pain, swelling, decreased energy. Started all after that. Damn Dennis gave him that penicillin. <laughs> Had some dental work done, gave him penicillin. He was in excellent health, walking three miles a day. Now he's too weak to even go to his own yard because that damn penicillin. Okay? So what do we want to know? He ain't telling you anything. You're not, it isn't the penicillin, right? Do you have a rash? No. It's not the penicillin. But he's convinced it is. So let's pull some things from his past health history. Well, he's had a catch. And he had that yellow jaundice as opposed to the other kind of jaundice. <laughs> when he was stationed in Vietnam, his medications are aspirin and ibuprofen for knee pain. Denies drug use, but he drank a bit and he's in the service 50 years ago. Okay. <laughs> what gave him the yellow jaundice? He had hepatitis, right? So he could have cirrhosis. Oh, it's one of those guys who has hep C that didn't get the vaccine. Okay. So he's pretty fragile, temporal wasting, no JBD, lungs are clear, heart sounds are regular, abdomen is protuberant, tense, bulging flanks. Bowel sounds are hypoactive and distant. Shifting dullness is present. <laughs> Remember shifting dullness? Oh, for the. And if he's got swelling in both of his lower extremities, is it likely that that belly might be full of fluid too? He's got telangiectasias. I gave you no asterisks. I mean, come on. Y'all know what he's got, right? What's he got? Joseph's. His belly hurts because it's full of about three liters of fluid, right? Okay. So we think it's cirrhosis. What are you going to order? It's the same thing. But, but if, we're check, if we're evaluating him for cirrhosis, CBC, CMP, We'll have the, a the CMP will have the AST and AMT and all that in it. Billy Rubin will be in that. We could. We could check for hepatitis. We could ultrasound his liver. What do cirrhotics get that can kill them rapidly? Yeah. We want to know something about his bleeding time? Yeah. Oh, PT, INR. We'll get the platelets on the uh, on the CBC. Okay. So we all want to think that cirrhosis causes AST and ALT to go up. They really don't. He has a little bit of elevation though it is Billy Rubin. Luckily his bleeding time is normal. Okay. He's got a little bit of decrease in his platelet. So he's fairly stable, right? Mm -hmm. What what do we want to do for him? You don't want to call a surgeon, do you? No. no. So if your answer is I don't want to call a surgeon, but what could we do for him in the ER? Let's yeah. pull the fluid off. Yeah. Get rid of what's causing. You can actually help this guy. I mean, and if you don't do it, just send him. There's somebody in interventional radiology that can come pull the fluid off and do a paracentesis. Okay. So we'd also check the albumin. We check his albumin level in his fluid, and we get him to, to see a GI. And tell him he's not allergic to penicillin. If you're allergic to that hepatitis that you got in Vietnam. He probably has hepatitis B, I would bet, if he got it in service. But never mind. Could be C. Okay. So you send him home, pull the float off, send him home, you put him on diuretics, low sodium diet, tell him don't take medicine that can make him bleed, and then get him, he needs to have an EGD to see if he has varices. 
All right, number seven. Seven-year-old female. This has only been going on for a day. It's severe epigastric pain, nausea, and vomiting. Started 12 hours ago. She also has fever and, and muscle aches. She doesn't drink alcohol. I'm going to ask that right off the bat. Okay. She's not bleeding. She's not having diarrhea. She's not having coffee ground emesis or hematemesis. What's the difference between those two things? Coffee ground emesis is kind of just a sign of old blood. It's kind of coagulated and then you threw it up. Whereas hematemesis is like fresh blood coming out. Okay. She doesn't have any history of pancreatitis or hepatitis. She hasn't lost any weight. She doesn't have any cardiovascular history. Oh, she has, yes. has had atrial fibrillation. And she has a seizure disorder. Okay. Do her exam. Blood pressure's okay. Pulse is up a little bit okay. Temperature's okay. She doesn't, or a little bit up. She does appear ill. No jaundice, no scleroliptus. She's extremely tender in the epigastric region, guarding and rebounding. Okay? But she's not distended. She's got a flat belly, but she's really tender. And you do a rectal exam like a good PA student, and it's negative. She has a non-specific gas pattern on her KUB. Does she have free air? Or is that the gastric bubble? That's the gastric bubble. So no free air. No pleural effusions. Those margins look good, don't they? She's got mild elevation in AST, ALT, and ALFOS. Interesting. She doesn't have pancreatitis. Billy Rubin's okay. White count is up. Okay. She's not an EBIT. It's okay. What do you do now? I hear whispering. Anybody? Hang yourself out there. Just do it. What? EGD. EGD? Yeah, we probably should have got EKG. I think it's normal. She's a she's a natural fit, but it's no, no acute changes. Yeah, I'm thinking. So you could have done a CT, you, but ultrasound, quick, easy, right at the bedside, right? So if you get kind of a non-specific gas pattern, you're not real, not real convinced. She has free air, she has an obstruction. You can scan her at the bedside. She has a stone sitting in there. Cholidocolithiasis. Okay. All right. Let's get through a couple more of these when we break. All right, 58-year-old. Two-day history of fever, anorexia, nausea, abdominal pain. So we've got another 50 to 60-year-old lady with upper abdominal pain. This one is radiating to the mid-back. She hasn't eaten. She doesn't want to eat. She hasn't vomited, but she's just sick and does not want to eat. No bowel changes. Her pain is like an 8 out of 10. It's pretty bad. Yeah, so we definitely want to keep acute pancreatitis on the top of the list here. Gallbladder. Could be a triple A. Keep that on the differential. Yep. Okay. 
So to kind of delineate if it's a triple A or not, you could ask her, you know, do you have hypertension? Do you have any heart disease? Do you take cholesterol medicine? So she said, yes, 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 and I smoke two packs of cigarettes per day. I would definitely put triple A on the top of the differential. So your labs. Nailed it. So her lipase and amylase are both grossly elevated. Elevated white count. So, so she's fairly stable. White count's elevated but not bad. If you can get her pain under control and send her home, you can. The Ransom criteria helps predict mortality, right? So in order to assess that, then you want an LDH. See what her sugar, her sugar was normal on her CMP, but LDH, her, her AST really isn't that bad. Maybe a tiny bit elevated. So don't memorize Ransom criteria. Know that it's pancreatitis. Um, memorize it when you're ready to take boards. But pull out your smartphone. There's calculators. Calculate it. Predict her mortality. See if she can go home. Don't drink alcohol, bowel rest. If she's intractably vomiting, you can't get her. She, I don't think she was just nauseated though. She wasn't really vomiting that much. You can probably send her home. And just she just needs to follow up in the next day. So, what are the two common causes of pancreatitis? Alcohol and gallstones. Gallstones, yes. So she would probably need a follow up, you know, ultrasound to assess her ball, assess her gallbladder. Yes. I forget why the liver enzymes elevated along with pancreas because they all drain out of that same common bile duct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you'll you'll see it goes both ways. Pancreatitis can elevate the liver enzymes and biliary tree blockage can elevate the pancreas enzymes. They, go, they all drain out of that same sphincter of OD. You can actually see um, you actually see spasm at the sphincter of OD, no blockage at all that will make it will give people pancreatitis. But all that has to be sorted out by the gastroenterologist. She she could have pain, she could have Severe sphincter of Odie dysfunction, too, to have no stones, but that's for somebody else to figure out a special office. Okay? You make the diagnosis of pancreatitis and get her to the right person. Okay? What test would confirm it? I mean, you already suspect it because of the lipase, right? Yeah. But how do you know if it's a big fat pancreatic tumor, tumor or if it's pancreatitis? CT or ultrasound. CT would be better. So here's an inflamed pancreatitis or pancreas. But it's laid really deep. So that's how bowel should look without an air fluid level. Do you see the difference? So, oh, well imagine that, you get in her chart, you start looking around, and she was seen two months ago in the same ER for an episode of unrelenting severe right upper pocket abdominal pain, and she had multiple gallstones in her gallbladder. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the cause of her pancreatitis. Okay. Sometimes you, the cause of pancreatitis remains unclear despite workup. It's, either, it's usually either gallstones or alcohol. If it's chronic pancreatitis, it is alcohol almost always all right one more quick break okay 26 year old diffuse abdominal pain so we got a young person finally this is PA student right diffuse abdominal pain 12 hours ago pressure mid-abdomen decreased appetite with no nausea vomiting last poop was two days ago no fever no chills no urinary symptoms, no STD symptoms, no chest pain. He seems like a normal, legit guy. He doesn't buy oxycodone on the street or anything. Okay. Okay. 
occasional use of alcohol because he's 26 and he likes to have a good time, non-smoker, no illicit drivers. And you believe. Okay? Vitals are stable, afebrile, he's mildly ill but non-toxic, he's alert. He's like still on the exam table and is not using a smartphone. So he's losing. <laughs> okay, pretty normal. He's got a flat abdomen, a little bit hypoactive on his bowel sounds. He's pretty tender though. Periumbilical and right lower quadrant, no guarding, no rebounding. So he's not perforated, or he's not having, he's not having peritoneal pain at this point, right? Rectal exam's normal. And that was really awkward because it was the first time he did a rectal exam on a 26-year-old male. And it was his first time too. Let's see him hold his neck. Okay? But then you're in the club. So elevated white count. Left shift. UA negative. What do you think it is? What's the classic presentation? Starts around the blankets, ends up at the Bernie's point. Almost all of them are I mean, at elevated white count. It's pretty diagnostic. Not always, but you can't rule it out with a normal white count. But you can say with pretty certainty, with a lot of certainty, if they have all the signs of appendicitis and then you do a white count that's elevated, that's probably what it is. I am not really like with the ratio, so don't even ask me. Um, would guarding not be present? I, would, I mean, I've never it, had appendicitis. Not at this point, probably because it's not, he's not having any peritoneal pain. He's still just kind of having visceral pain. Okay. You know, so it's just early. If it's early, right. If it's late, I mean, maybe he's starting to form a little abscess or he maybe a little micro curve, then he might get really severely rigid and guarding on that side. Yes. And you could do the pill jar yeah. and the buckets of the table, <laughs> shape of the hips. Um, okay, so there's your diagnosis. So if they're pregnant, you try to ultrasound it. But otherwise, CT. Sometimes they'll put rectal contrast in to see it a little bit better. Sometimes you don't need to. You can do low radiation to you don't have to do a ton of radiation to see it. But you can also ultrasound it. Try to get it. All right. So watch them. <laughs> it's unclear if you think you highly suspect it. You don't see anything on the CT. Watch them. Send them home. But the key there is getting them to follow up. You know, you need to follow up within 12 hours. If you're certain it's an appendicitis, the only treatment is certain. Okay. Unpasteurized goat Okay. Any questions on appendicitis? Can appendicitis cause left lower quadrant pain? Yes. What's that test called? Yeah. And then, but also some people, the appendix sits on the other side. It's rare, but it happens. So even if you catch appendicitis early, the only thing you can do is take it out. There's like no stopping the progression. So it's usually like a picolith or something that's obstructed it. And it's almost like an incarcerated hernia. Once you once you obstruct it, it gets necrosis, and we just can't get it back. It just it'll just die. You gotta take it off. Now this whole idea of, oh, I was in there anyway, so I just took out your appendix too. If you ever go see a surgeon that says that, run the other way. They do not do that anymore. They should not do that. Remember when we talked about GI? What, it, what do we think maybe the appendix is for? It's our little reservoir of good bacteria. Help repopulate our colon should be needed. I mean, we should not be taking appendices out for no reason. People did that because they could bill for it. Instead of getting paid $5,000, they can get paid $8,000. I mean, it's just don't. When you get started. <laughs> 
Okay, go, y'all take a break, like five minutes, and then do the rest of these.